Welcome to my apiary. So I'm still cutting up plywood here, and I will be for quite some time. It's a bit of a big project. So what I've done here, uh, you can see a skid of plywood here. Um, and there's actually a few more skids of plywood. <clears throat> what we did was, I've got one right here. <clears throat> what we did when we broke the plywood down is we, uh, we used the track saw to just cross cut the sheet uh, into the length of a pallet. Uh, a two-way pallet is what I'm building. So now I've brought them in to the table saw and I'm going to cut it to width for two pallets. There's about four inches left over. So that's all I'm doing here. And you can see they've been out, they've been in the shed, they've been outside. So a bit of frost and ice and snow stuck to them. Uh, so what that means to me is I need to run my saw stop in what they call bypass mode. If you're not familiar with saw stop, is it has a, a safety blade break technology uh, that uh, Will, will stop the blade, it will stop the saw if you touch it with your fingers. And uh, it, it's, it's quite a severe situation. It, it often ruins the blade and the blade break itself uh, then needs to be replaced to the tune of about $105. So if you're looking at a, this is a pretty decent blade I have in here probably fifty seventy five dollars for that blade uh, they really don't want that to happen I've had it happen a few times in the past fortunately uh, it's happened with crappy blades or something I, I had it happen on a blade one time and it didn't damage the blade and I had the blade inspected uh, by a saw shop just to be sure so that's the whole uh, explanation behind bypass mode so I have to run the saw stop in bypass mode and, you know, I've used saw, table saws for most of my life and uh, you just need to respect them and make sure you have, uh, you know, a sure footing and balance and make sure you don't make any false moves, move slowly and deliberately, uh, don't touch the blade. And it's not like I don't do those things when I'm running in normal mode, when, when the the blade is quote safe. Uh, I'm always very careful about the blade. A little more so when it's in bypass mode for obvious reasons. So that's uh, that's what I'm doing here and I just have to cross cut these. Uh, it's actually a rip cut. I just have to rip these. There's uh, I don't know there's 50 pieces or something. Something about 50 pieces here.
You can see one of my least favorite things is I get water on my cast iron table saw top. I'm not crazy about that. Okay, so here's a little packaging tip I want to share with you. I'm putting this on a pallet, you can't see the pallet. It's it's actually not as wide as the as the uh, pieces, but it, it'll be just fine. However, uh, I want to stack these up quite high and anytime you've got a, a single stack of something of course you know it becomes unstable and wobbly. Um, so when palletizing things uh, I can do some things to make them more stable. So what I can do is use my off cuts, put them, put them in here just to tie the two sides together. And it also gives some center support uh, to the load so that it's not just supported on the ends. Uh, and that'll, so that'll help support it all around. And what I've done is I've, I've put this, uh, I've put five courses here. So I've got ten pallets. So that'll be really nice to look at that pallet and you'll be able to count how many how many uh, pallets. <laughs> it's tough when you're talking about a skid and a pallet and a pallet and a skid and a, you know, but uh, you know what I mean. So I'll be able to tell how many pallets I have on that stack at one time. to explain a little bit of the method to my madness. I've been spending days uh, lap jointing and gluing pieces of plywood together to make make parts. Uh, keep in mind this diagram is not really to scale. Uh, this ended up being far too small. But what I've got here is, and I'll explain some of my reasoning. <clears throat> Don't forget that the uh, grain direction on these sheets goes this way okay so when you're building something in woodworking and you know if you're looking for a correct direction etc you always want to kind of put the grain direction a long way in the piece I've explained in previous videos kind of why I think that's important one of the reasons I think it's important is it just looks better and because of this big project I'm doing right now, uh, I'm building for a customer. I'm not building for my own. Well, I am building some for my own, but I'll cover that in a minute. Then I want to cut my parts so that the grain direction on the covers, I didn't write here. These are all covers. Run the long way on the cover. So. So what I've got here is I've got about 16 and a half and I've got about 20 and three quarter here. So I want the green direction going 20 and three quarter. Now that uses up a little more material because if I go green direction this way, I can only get four down here. And so then I can only get eight covers per sheet. And again, this is not the scale. So this this cutoff at the bottom is far smaller. It's actually too small for another cover. But it's a considerable size piece. As is, as is this over here. It's a considerably wide piece, but it's, uh, it's not wide enough for a cover. Okay? So can, if I were to cut these the other way with the long, the long cover 
dimension this way, I could get 10 out of this sheet. And just that then the grain would be going the way that I don't want it to go. So with the pallets, we have a similar situation. Um, I could get five pallets out of here if I were to cut one this way at the bottom. So that's, that's not too bad. I've done that a lot. So then you get four pallets going the correct direction. You get one going the direction that I don't prefer. But what I've done <clears throat> is I've cut my pallets here. So I only get four pallets. Uh, you've seen us cutting with the track saw. Our first cut was to rip or cross cut each sheet across this way. So then we get these two. Then I put this piece up on the table saw and I ripped off a pallet sized piece and a spare. Similarly at the end, then I actually haven't cut these yet. I'm just about to cut uh, this again. And then these two lines don't really match up because the pallet is, is uh, 20 and 5 eighths and the cover is only 16 and, and uh, 5 eighths. <clears throat> But what I can do is I can get a, I can get a cover out of this piece. I can get another cover out of this piece, similar to how I'm cutting them here, uh, and then a, a spare, and then spares here too. Okay. So similarly here, I get my four covers down here. Uh, that's what we did with the track saw. It's cut number one, we we ripped these right down there, and then I put them on my. Uh, very arm saw and I cross cut each one of these this way okay then I actually took this piece here which was too narrow for a cover and I I cross cut it as well at the length for covers I was left with a piece at the bottom that was either wide enough for a cover and not long enough in these two cases or uh, not long enough and not wide enough <laughs> so that was a bit of a, a challenge for that piece <clears throat> but usable so what I do with these pieces is for example I can take this this is the wider uh, this is the wider piece here this is a long nice long full eight foot piece that's not wide enough for a cover but what I can do is I can take two of these and I can stitch them together and make another pallet. So this will be twice as wide and then I can rip that to size for make a pallet. <clears throat> They're about, I got about 13 inches uh, of material left there that I can use and again pallets 20 and 5 eighths so I get um, I get uh, almost a half a half another pallet there out of, out of this. Uh, similarly, these this strip ends up being quite small. I'll show you here. This is <clears throat> this is the strip that's that comes out of that side, and it's not very wide. So that's only four and a quarter. If I lose an inch with the lap, uh, so three and a quarter doesn't buy me that much. If I've got a whole piece that uh, I can use and maybe just add a couple inches on the end. I'll use one of those, but I'm not going to make a pallet out of little tiny strips like that. We'll possibly use those elsewhere. So anyway, this is this is just, a, you know, I don't want to go into too much specific detail. Honestly, this is largely off the cuff. Uh, I'll take the large uh, pile of, of off cuts that I have, see what fits together, make parts. Then I'll take what I've got left, stitch together, make parts. And honestly, things get pretty small, you know. I've got four different pieces here. I was making a, I was making a cover, and and this piece ended up not wide enough and not long enough for anything. So, so it just sits aside, and just for the uninitiated, with this idea of lapping plywood together, all I do is I cut, uh, I cut. A groove in the end of the plywood uh, to give me <clears throat> to give me three eighths. This is a three quarter plywood, so I have three eighths here, and then I cut away three eighths, and I arbitrarily make this an inch. 
just what I do. And then I do that the same there. And then those two fit together like that. I put tight bond three in there. I can't, uh, when I make a bigger piece, I could do this one, but when I make a bigger piece, they get too broad to clamp. So I'll put, I'll just drive screws through that um, until the glue dries. The little screw holes, uh, well, they're number 10 screws, they're not that small, but the screw holes don't bother anything. And the screw holes, uh, you know, they'll get covered when I wax dip the products and, and whatnot. So we're all good there. So I just thought I'd go over that and, uh, you know, kind of explain some of the, the nonsense that I've been uh, involved in the last few days because I'm about to cut, I'm about to cut these pieces. So I'm about to cut two covers out of this piece uh, and then I've got a bunch more chunks that I can stitch together and make more covers etc. I've got a lot of extra covers here. So this is kind of one of the finished products. You can see this still has the screws in it uh, holding the glue and you know it looks pretty good. This one this one actually worked out really nice. You can't really even see the seam. Uh, you can see a little more on this side because of the difference in the wood color, but this works really good. The price of, of plywood, paying over $60 for the sheet, I want to maximize the use of it. I don't want to throw much out. This one here, on the other hand, I got a little carried away. I just had piece after piece and uh, ended up... <laughs> what is there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine... There's nine pieces of plywood in that, uh, in that cover. Uh, funny enough, there's one piece here in this corner, and there's two here. <laughs> Not sure how that happened, but it's just a lap joint or somehow. Uh, anyway, so sometimes I get a little carried away, but you know that's still you know going to make a hive cover for me. And and I want to clarify that this is for my equipment. These are not covers for the customer. The customer is going to get all the covers that have the 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 grain the way I want them. One piece, all that. They get the premium stuff. Uh, and I'm going to use these for my covers because my experience they work fine. And uh, you know plywood is so expensive that you know I'm kind of poor. So I don't want to, I don't want to pay for plywood. Okay, so that's what I get out of those pieces, and I think there's 20 of them there. So I get two covers. Those are ready to go. I get, uh, so I get one that's long enough for a cover, but not wide enough. I get two that are wide enough for a cover, but not long enough. So <laughs> I'll probably lop these together. It's going to take three of them and I'll make covers for myself out of those off cuts. And then these that are not wide enough, then they get they get jointed at the end, at the side here, and on the next one, then I'll put the next one together with that for, uh, for a cover. So it's, it's a lot of extra work, but you know, that's not big enough for anything. And I get to have my grain the way I want. This one is a bit of, you know, not sure what to do with these because you have to lap that twice you'd have to take two of these make it wider and then take three of them and make them longer to make a cover and I might do that but you know maybe not uh, those I cut both ways just to show you uh, these I'm going to rip them all one way and then I'll run them all through again just so I don't have to reset the fence with every sheet
Okay, so here's my pile of covers. That's actually that's half of the covers. Three and five eighths is what they should be finished size. Okay, so again, I'm going to get I'm going to get one cover and then this much by design. Preparing to make a bunch of these lap joints. Now there's a couple of different ways that I've made these and I could make these. <clears throat> the, the way that I'm doing it now requires two setups on the saw, however I don't need to change out the saw blade. So that's a little consolation. I don't need to set up the dado blade. I don't need to change over to that. However the dado blade uh, method requires only one setup or only one pass through the saw. Um, so it's a judgment call, whatever you want to do. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is, this is this is commonly known as shiplap. Uh, so you take half of the material away on each sheet and lap it together with some glue and now you've got a bigger sheet. Of course that's not big enough for anything useful. I've got a whack of these little guys here. I haven't measured it up to see how many I need for for a cover, I should do that. What are they? Yeah, almost eight inches. So that eight inch nets me seven. Uh, so I'll take two inches away. That's just over 23 and a half, 22, 21 and a half. So three will give me just a little more than I need for one cover. Uh, that's a good thing to know because normally what I'll do is I'll just uh, I'll, I'll lap every piece on two sides and then put them together and let the chips fall where they may. However, if this is only going to be a little bit too long, uh, I will um, I will not bother to do that. What I'll do is I'll lap this this one, this one, this one, this one, leave finished edges here and here because that's my that's my finished end. So this in this cut, I'll be uh, I'll be running something like this. I'll be just running that score, and then the next cut, I'll stand up like that and uh, cut vertically in the workpiece.
raise the blade to that one inch that I've cut off of there. And, and these, you know, you can cut a little bit deep in here because the, the important thing is that you cut, cut enough and uh, it's important that this, this measurement is just perfect uh, between the two so that you have a smooth, you have a smooth uh, joint there. And there we go. So the first two that I cut, I'll take off and uh, compare them to see if that joint is just right. Set a block. Set my feather board. I like this to be nice and tight because these panels are, especially the big panels, they sit here and they're. You, know, you want to keep them vertical, make that joint nice and square. That's a lot of cutting. I'm tired. I'm going to go in for a break, but I want to show you something before I do. So you realize that I'm cutting off uh, two laminations of six. This is a SPF plywood, meaning it's made from spruce, fir, or pine. Generally this stuff is spruce. Uh, northern climates, <clears throat> we grow more spruce than anything, white spruce. This plywood has six laminations. Uh, some plywood have, has way more laminations. Uh, so you can do the math that a three-quarter inch sheet of plywood with six laminations is one-eighth of an inch per lamination. Okay, six-eighths is three-quarters. I know people don't do fractions anymore, but that's what it is. So my saw blade is one eighth. So uh, I'm cutting off three of those laminations. I'm trying to split that plywood directly in two. Uh, so one of those laminations goes up the pipe into the into the uh, sawdust bin. Two of them curl off in into the waste pile. And I want to show you something. Uh, this is actually not very dramatic, but almost without exception these pieces come off and they banana a bit okay so that's not straight that's that's curved up <clears throat> this is the outside of the plywood this is the outside lamination and how plywood is made is one lamination goes one way the next one goes the other way and that therefore makes the plywood very stable it makes it stay flat er longer uh, and you know not want to not want to warp you get lumber and lumber warps pretty easily because it's an organic product it's the nature of it however uh, plywood being a manufactured product using organic material of course uh, wood wood uh, expands and contracts uh, with ambient uh, relative humidity or ambient humidity it absorbs moisture from the air. It gives off moisture, uh, you know, when the humidity is low. I'll 
show you on this one a little easier to see. You can see this grain is this way. So pretend this isn't plywood, pretend this is lumber. So what's going to happen here is when this lumber gets, uh, gets wet or absorbs moisture from the air, it will expand across the grain. Okay. Uh, there is an expansion with the grain, but it's almost imperceptible. It's never taken into account. Um, I guess unless you're building a bridge or something, uh, something with extremely long span or something like that, but, but never in furniture, beaking equipment and stuff like that. So, so you can count on the, the wood being uh, stable along the grain. And that's particularly why I make the point that it's the proper way to put the grain the long way on the piece and that's why I'm going through all this trouble. I don't think it's really going to make that much difference however it makes a difference in my head. So when this material uh, gets wet humidity or rain or something or it gets dry low humidity heavy sunshine because this is going to be outdoors the expansion contraction will be this direction. Okay, and this being a hive cover, uh, that will be across the hive, not end to end. That's about four inches difference in a Langstroth hive. I've talked about that before. Now this is this is laminations. So how that plays out <clears throat> is is when it rains, this lamination will get wet. If it rains a lot, the next one might get wet, you know, perhaps. But this one's certainly going to get wet. So that'll expand across and that'll tend to make this bow in this direction uh, and then when it dries it'll it'll flatten out or it'll bow the other way um, now not much because it's six laminations and the next one is going the other way so that's plywood it's very stable but it does happen <clears throat> And the reason I show you this is this is a perfect example of this. And this shows me uh, where this, this plywood is wet and where it's dry. This shows me that the plywood is wet, wetter on the outside than it is on the inside. Wetter by what comparison? Wetter than when it was manufactured. I'm only assuming that perhaps every lamination was the same moisture content when the plywood was put together in the factory. Maybe that's not a safe assumption, I don't know. But I think probably it is. I, I think they've probably got that covered. So what's happened here is I've cut these two laminations off. So we have two laminations working against each other. So the, the natural course of this wood movement is going to happen. And what's happened is the long grain lamination is shorter than the short grain lamination. Okay, So that tells me that the short grain lamination, because when the short grain lamination gets wet, it's going to expand in this direction. The long grain lamination gets wet, it's going to expand in the other way, which is really, really short, so it's really not going to expand much, but it will. You know, in certain conditions it will. You wonder why sometimes those old cabinets, the drawers are sticky in the summer but not in the winter? That's why. The drawer guides uh, swell up in the summer. So that's just an example of two laminations that are opposite direction to each other. There's a long grain here that's not going to expand uh, considerably with with uh, moisture and, and humidity, there's, there's a short grain one here that is going to expand across here and that tells me that this lumber is wetter than it was when it was manufactured because this has expanded and this has not and that's why it's curved. It's not curved much but it is curved and you can see it in just 16 and a half inches. Right? So that's wood movement. And that's why I have a hard time in my head purposefully and consciously running my grain direction the opposite way than, than kind of what I was taught in, in my woodworking studies.
Uh, and that's what's causing me all this extra work. Uh, it's not because I love it, it's just, it's what it is. Makes a nice product. So it uses up the, uses up the, the uh, it makes a nice product for the ones I don't stitch together and it uses up the offcuts for the ones I do stitch together. And the price apply with today, every square inch is worth money. Uh, so that's the whole thing. That's my story and I'm sticking to it.